Hello Info person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some of the new updates and some of the recent discoveries coming from the Honga Tonga Hapai volcano that erupted exactly one year ago. With this massive and unexpected explosion basically becoming a trending topic on Google for at least a few weeks. And so in this video I wanted to do a kind of a one year later update, mostly discussing some of the more unexpected discoveries and also briefly reviewing what we've learned about this volcano in the last 12 months. The volcano that even today, if you look at some of the older Google pictures, still actually has some of the more outdated data from over a year ago. But as you start zooming in, you'll notice that suddenly the island disappears. And that's of course how powerful and how explosive this event was. Completely destroying the entire island, releasing a huge amount of matter in the process, including of course sulfur dioxide, and more importantly, water vapor, but also creating one of the most explosive events in recent history, generating one of the few known tsunami events that were actually caused by a volcano. With all of this happening in just a few days, and more importantly, all of this completely unexpected. With this island disappearing from existence, because the entire surface here dropped by approximately 750 meters. But you've probably already heard all of this from some of the previous videos that you can find in the description. So what exactly have the scientists learned in the last year or so? Well, I guess let's start with the more obvious and more unusual effect, the tsunami. Less than 100 tsunamis known to us were historically caused by volcanic eruptions. Now, the vast majority of tsunamis on the planet have always been generated either because of earthquakes or because of some kind of an underwater landslide produced by some kind of instability. But it turns out that in this case, this event generated a tsunami wave approximately 90 meters in height actually taller than a lot of other waves in modern history. But what made this wave really unusual is how quickly it spread across the planet and how it was actually able to affect regions much, much farther away from the epicenter itself. Now, the wave itself was not really that big when it reached other countries, but it still caused a little bit of damage. Although what's surprising here is that it was traveling approximately twice as fast as a typical volcano-triggered tsunami and moreover was a lot more powerful than anyone expected. It was actually traveling at approximately 1,000 kilometers per hour, or about 620 miles per hour, across the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Oceans. But strangely enough, it was able to reach the Atlantic Ocean and even the Caribbean without going around South America. Now, at this point, it was actually really tiny, but it was still visible and still detectable. And up until recently, it was kind of difficult to explain how this was possible. And that's until the scientists started to combine this with the observations from the acoustic waves as well. This right here shows us the shock wave, the acoustic shock wave, as it traveled across the world several times from the explosion itself. And this was allegedly one of the loudest sounds we've recorded in the last few decades from any kind of an explosion. It was reported by people thousands and thousands of kilometers away, even in certain parts of the North America. But more surprisingly, this acoustic wave was so powerful that it produced a kind of a positive feedback mechanism on the water below it and thus increased the power of tsunami as well. Or to be more exact, it created a kind of a resonance with the water waves underneath, which then amplified the effects of tsunami and even accelerated its velocity. So it was actually a combination of air pressure and the tsunami waves that resulted in the effects were observed once the water waves reached various regions. And it's actually the effects of this atmospheric wave that then resulted in a tsunami in the Caribbean and, of course, the Atlantic Ocean. Although these types of effects have been observed before, but not to this extent. This was the first such event recorded by modern instruments and the first such event that was finally explained scientifically with a lot of data behind it. So definitely really interesting. Then there was also lightning, and like a lot of it. This was one of the most lightning active events detected in modern history as well. There were several satellites keeping track of all of the lightning happening in this region, and all of them had trouble counting how many lightning strikes there actually were. For example, here the calculations were for approximately 400,000 strikes in just 24 hours. Although ironically, this is actually just the limit of strikes that it can calculate per 24 hours. So the actual number is most likely much higher. But even this would suggest over 5,000 strikes per minute, or basically about 1,000 strikes per second but very likely much, much higher. One of the NASA satellites has even reported detecting several major gamma rays, something that we normally detect from black holes, pulsars, or extremely powerful explosions far, far away in the rest of the universe. But in this case, coming directly from this volcano because of how ridiculously powerful some of these lightning strikes were. Although in this case, this is not a new discovery. Gamma rays have been detected from various lightning strikes. But in this case, there were just way, way too many. 
Once again, highlighting how ridiculously powerful this explosion was. Here's what all of this looked like on the International Space Station a day after. And I'll talk about what this caused in a few minutes as well. First, there was also something else that was not expected. So if you've ever studied volcanic eruptions, you might know that there's actually a really dangerous event that happens, in some cases, in certain eruptions, known as the pyroclastic flow. You can sort of see it in this picture from the Philippines from 1984 as a kind of a really fast moving current, usually containing a lot of volcanic matter, but also a lot of hot gas that sort of starts acting like a liquid and flows really, really fast downhill. In this case, the speed was about 100 kilometers per hour, which by the way, is also the main reason or the main cause for most of the fatalities around volcanoes. But this flow is really destructive. This is actually what happens to a building in this case, this is in Mexico in 1982, if it gets caught by this pyroclastic flow. Also, the iconic eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, or the destruction of Pompeii, was basically all caused by this event. And turns out, the Tonga volcano also had one. But strangely enough, it was underwater. In other words, it also had a very, very powerful and very destructive pyroclastic flow that traveled approximately 80 kilometers away from the epicenter destroying everything in its path, but also destroying a lot of the life in the process. A lot of sea life that used to live here met the same fate as a lot of life in Pompeii back in 79 AD. And this makes it one of the longest, if not the longest pyroclastic flows in modern history, which is apparently what destroyed those internet cables, cutting all communication to Tonga for at least a few weeks. But then we also had a lot of atmospheric effects as well. I mean, this picture alone tells you that something must have happened. But intriguingly enough, even today it's not entirely clear how this volcano affected the atmosphere. Now, in a typical eruption, because of the emissions of various sulfur compounds, we usually expect the atmospheric temperature to drop by at least a fraction of a degree for at least a year. And this is exactly what happened after the 91 eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines, the most powerful previous eruption, with approximately the same power as this one, that lowered the temperature of the planet by approximately 1 degree for one year. Here's the satellite image of all of the aerosols released by this volcano. But this was the result of the sulfur emissions. Turns out, the eruption in Tonga was dramatically different. It only released about 2% of the sulfur amounts compared to the Mount Pinatubo, and in contrast released a huge amount of water vapor. With all of this water vapor actually being the result of the explosion itself. There was actually a small eruption a day prior, and this very likely opened some kind of a protrusion where all of the water from the surrounding ocean started to seep in and flow deeper and deeper into the ground. And as soon as this water started mixing with all of the magma, it resulted in a huge explosion that almost instantly evaporated everything, releasing an enormous amount of water all at once, but more importantly, depositing all of this water into the upper atmosphere possibly as high as 58 kilometers, as determined by recent studies. And water vapor, unlike a lot of other elements, is relatively light. And it also doesn't fall to the ground right away and sticks around in the atmosphere for a pretty long time. And so even though the sulfur compounds would most likely dissipate within just a few months, water vapor would not. In the few months time, they even formed two separate layers, both having almost opposite effects. Water vapor usually warms up the atmosphere. It's basically a greenhouse gas whereas the sulfur compounds do the opposite. But there was not a lot of sulfur, yet a lot of water. And so the scientists studying this expected that the atmosphere of the planet might actually warm up by a few degrees for the next few months or possibly in the next few years. But in this case, like everything else about this volcanic eruption, things were just really, really complicated. First of all, it was discovered that the mid layers of the atmosphere, the mid stratosphere, decreased in temperature by about three degrees for about five months. But the amount of moisture in the global stratosphere increased by about 5 to 10 percent and is even elevated right now. That's actually something that's expected to raise the temperatures. And the average temperature around the world did go up by about 0.9 degrees compared to previous year. But it was not as high as some of the previous years before that. This figure from National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration illustrates this pretty well. And so it's still not clear if the temperature actually did go up or if it dropped overall. And in this case, some of the scientists have already tried to explain that this water vapor is going to have a lot of additional effects afterwards. For example, the sunlight might break down the water molecule into various reactive ions. And these ions can start acting on things like methane, another very potent greenhouse gas, turning it into something entirely different, which could then decrease the temperature once again. But more importantly, a lot of these hydroxyl molecules coming from water 
can also start affecting ozone. And if it does drop the ozone layer, that of course would be a bit of a problem. Although at the moment it's still not clear what effects all of this is going to have. It might take a few more years of observation before the scientists can conclude what all of this is going to create. But then there is something else that kind of was completely unexpected. Something that is definitively confirmed. Directly visible in this before and after picture. This is only 5 days apart. And this was really really surprising to me as well. This is life. Within just one single day, it literally kickstarted a completely new generation of life within hundreds of kilometers away from the source. This is actually a satellite picture measuring the amounts of chlorophyll present in the water. Basically this is phytoplankton. Tiny organisms living in the oceans producing all of our oxygen but also absorbing all of our CO2. And to me personally this is an absolutely incredible discovery, actually absolutely insane. It took one single day for all of this life to start consuming all of the nutrients produced by the volcano, dramatically increasing the phytoplankton growth, instantly changing the entire ecosystem. Which of course highlights how important volcanoes are for life on our planet. And even though they were responsible for a lot of previous extinction events, as this picture shows, they are also crucial to survival of life on the planet as well providing an important link between volcanism and marine ecosystems. And the most surprising part is how quickly all of this happened. Less than a day later, there was life everywhere in the oceans. Kind of a symbolic creation through destruction. But anyway, so these were the biggest discoveries from the last year or so, but I'm sure, as I mentioned before, we'll be making more discoveries as the scientists learn more about the effects in the atmosphere. And it's quite likely that we're actually going to be talking about this eruption for many many years to come. But in this case I just wanted to focus on this because it's been one year now and so I was kind of curious to find out how did this change our planet. And turns out some of these changes were actually quite dramatic. But until future discoveries, well that's pretty much it. Check out previous videos and all of the relevant links in the description below. Subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying a wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.